still on. Hello everyone and warmly welcome to this afternoon. This is really a great time. On November the 1st, just eight days away, world leaders are gathering in Glasgow for a hugely important event, the United Nations Annual Conference on Climate Change, COP26, Conference of the Parties. In recent months, flash floods have immobilized parts of Britain, Germany and China. Record heat waves and fires have ravaged parts of North America, all over the world, unusual weather events show that dystopia is not on the horizon. It's here today, and already the impacts are huge. So how can the world end its addiction to greenhouse gases that are warming the atmosphere and already so damaging the planet for us and our future generations? As a co-host of the upcoming COP26 climate talks, the United Kingdom has stepped up its climate commitments. Last Monday, it published its plan to achieve ambitious 2030, 2035 and 2050 targets. Can it do it? How will all this affect our lives where we live? And what should we ourselves be doing? So I'm delighted to say that with me is Anne-Marie Trevelyan, and now the lead trade deal negotiator for Boris Johnson's government. For eight months before that, she was the Minister of State for Energy and Clean Growth. And before that, Secretary of State for International Development. And she is, of course, our local MP and also a UK international champion for COP2, COP26. Uh, Minister Boris Johnson said this week that green is good, green is right, green works. How crucial are the next 10 years in ending our addiction to fossil fuels and adapting to the already devastating effects of climate change? So we refer to uh, you know, the years through to 2030 as the decisive decade. Uh, for the reason that the scientific work which has been done by the IPCC uh, and set out shows that unless we can bring down at pace uh, the uh, both carbon dioxide and other uh, gases that are causing this, what I describe as like a blanket wrapping around the planet, heating us up, uh, at pace we will find ourselves uh, in temperature rises uh, beyond two, three, four degrees, which are, have catastrophic con consequences for our weather patterns and indeed for the areas on our planet which uh, can sustain life. So uh, the challenge uh, we all have uh, been set and uh, was set in motion and agreed to by the whole world at COP21, which was uh, in Paris. Uh, and then everyone signed the Paris Agreement was to try and work out how as nations and as a family of nations, we could find those solutions to drive down uh, the level of emissions so that we can stop the planet continuing its heat rise. Now, you're the UK champion to COP26 for adaptation and resilience. What does that role mean, very briefly? And what are your three top hopes for the conference, what the outcomes of the conference? So as the uh, UK, as you say, has, is co-hosting COP26, and we have uh, the COP unit uh, here in Whitehall uh, driving and indeed organising the conference on behalf of the UN, but also a challenge to really drive through all the negotiating uh, challenges that uh, every COP brings. And every five years, uh, this one five years on from Paris, an opportunity to really look holistically and crystallise what it is. It became clear um, to the team uh, last year, sort of 18 months ago, uh, that we... The whole world has been looking very much uh, at one pillar of what the Paris Agreement had, which was the mitigation challenge. Quite rightly, we have to change the way we uh, produce our energy and indeed reduce uh, the sources we use, things like coal, which have huge um, greenhouse gas emissions. But that's only one pillar of the Paris Agreement. There are three pillars. So mitigation is one. Uh, financing is another. There is uh, what has become a totemic number, the raising of $100 billion a year to be used uh, 2020 through 2025 to help developing countries to make the changes they need to. But the third pillar, really importantly, was all about adaptation and resilience. Um, and as uh, we took on uh, the chairmanship, uh, it was uh, our view that that had been ignored for too long. So the Prime Minister asked that I would take on effectively that pillar and be the advocate uh, not only uh, speaking about it and raising awareness, but also giving confidence, I think, and energizing those developing countries for whom they are not the ones who have caused or indeed are putting out the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, their economies are much smaller uh, and, uh, you know, they have very much smaller energy 
uh, uses anyway, but if they are moving, they want to move to clean energy. But the key point is that they are under uh, the most pressures from the impacts of uh, these climate change issues from uh, fires to uh, floods to you know small island states who are you know at risk of disappearing underwater uh, the extremities of a hurricane coming you know not a one in ten year hurricane but two in one year so that there isn't even time or indeed the finances to be able to uh, recover for those communities so I have spent the last year with a uh, an absolute focus talking to those developing countries championing their needs within the UNFCCC system. If you like to remind those for whom the mitigation piece is the important part, uh, why they've got to do it and why they've got to do it at pace. So I hope, and I hope they would say so, that I have been a good champion and really brought to the fore the reasons why we're doing this. Not just because we know as big countries we need to, but there are very real and urgent uh, you know, recipients of our efforts that we need to help them uh, to do that and also how to drive that financing to support them to do it. Right. So right. let's let's start with mitigation and then we'll move on to adapt to adaptation, if we may. Um, I think there's some good news. I mean, UK is, is now one of the world leaders in offshore wind power. Mm -hmm. um, the year after I was born, we produced 97 percent of our electricity from coal. That percentage is now down to two percent. Right. Nearly 100 percent of Scottish electricity now comes from renew renewables. Though the figure is a bit le well, rather less for UK electricity. Now, the new net zero strategy published this week promises to quadruple offshore wind energy. And I know there are plans for more solar and nuclear energy, more energy as well. Tell us a little bit more, if you would. So we have been leading the way in uh, building uh, the renewal sector. 28% of all uh, offshore wind is around UK shores. And it's an extraordinary uh, statistic, really, considering our size. But there has been a huge drive. And because we were very early on in thinking about this, uh, and back in 2008, when the Climate Change Act was brought uh, in, from there came the creation of the Climate Change Committee, uh, who are, if you like, our independent auditors, uh, having a look at how we're doing as a country and, uh, you know, pushing us along and helping us to challenge ourselves and think about what those changing policies need to be. We created uh, something which, and I have discovered, many other countries are both very jealous of and thinking about how to copy, which was something called the contract for difference, which was a way to encourage businesses to create and build renewable energy uh, supplies by providing them with long term secure financing to help them to be able to uh, make the very heavy capital investment costs that were needed. In doing that, we have driven a huge new industry, both in solar uh, and indeed onshore and off shore wind and it continues a pace we're going to see uh, new new work coming through in floating wind uh, the opportunity for uh, other marine opportunities is just those technologies are just coming to the fore so we have created a system which is really empowering and giving businesses the opportunity to change one of the other really important parts is not only um, you know creating the new renewable skills but because renewable energy is intermittent, making sure that we have a base load which is secure. At the moment, our base load is built on both nuclear and gas. Now, clearly, we want to uh, move away from unabated gas because that has a great many emissions. So one of the areas to do that whilst we go on this decarbonisation journey is to look at the carbon capture and storage challenge. Now, this is a challenge that... Uh, a number of countries have tried over the years. It's very expensive still. We're still doing it, but we have just launched, uh, in fact, last week, uh, the first two areas in the UK that are going to take that to a commercialised level, which is very exciting in the Humber and Teesside on the East Coast uh, and in the Northwest uh, around Liverpool and Manchester. OK, and, so, then, and under this, the, the carbon is captured and then it's stored underground for... Yes, system. that's right. Old oil wells. OK, now... Um, uh, the International Energy Agency has told mm. governments not to develop any more oil or gas reserves uh, if we want a shot at limiting the worst effects of climate change. So, um, I mean, I take on board exactly all, all those great things you're describing there. Yet um, it took ages for the government to finally reject last year the deeply contested application to open a new open cast coal mine in Drewridge Bay here in Northumberland. Uh, in July 2020, the government agreed to use 900 million pounds of taxpayers' money for a gas pipeline in Mozambique. The government is still opening the door to new fossil fuel licenses. The proposal for a new Cumbrian coal mine has still not been rejected. 
And the government are also considering approving an oil field in Shetland that will operate until 2050. Now, how can that be consistent and how can that help the UK's reputation or influence on climate around the world? So I think one of the really interesting challenges and the really difficult challenges for all of us, uh, not only, you know, the UK is really driving forward at a pace that very few other countries are, is that this is a marathon, not a sprint, albeit the fact that this decisive decade means we have to really drive uh, at bringing down those figures uh, quickly. So in order to do that, we have to maintain security of supply. So we have to move at a pace, but we must ensure that our systems don't fall over on the way through because that doesn't benefit anybody. So well, well, let me maybe ask you about the Cambo uh, um, yes, oil. Of course. Now, the first phase of development aims to extract um, oil, which I understand will produce over 70 million tonnes of carbon dioxide. Now, I, I'm, I've been told that that's the equivalent of the annual emission of 18 new coal-fired power stations. Why do we need this? Isn't this, it feels, doesn't it feel a bit like the right hand not knowing what the left hand's doing here? Well, no, but the point is we need security supply and we need to be able to continue that, which is why we must work in the abatement areas like CCUS and in America, they're doing a huge amount of work in direct air capture, for instance, another uh, mitigating, uh, you know, uh, abatement uh, solution to reduce the CO2 into the atmosphere because we are on a journey and we have to make sure that we can do this in a way that doesn't uh, cause crippling problems for uh, our industries, for jobs, for livelihoods and indeed those things. So this is the challenge that governments always have to balance, uh, which is uh, how do we make that? So the um, North Sea transition deal, which I negotiated with the uh, North Sea oil and gas industries earlier this year when I was energy minister, uh, is a really interesting challenge. It's world class and a number of other parts of the world now looking at how they do it, which is to challenge uh, those companies not only to think about how in, in their processes themselves within, if you like, the production part uh, of the uh, extraction of oil and gas, they make that much, much cleaner. So they're looking at electrification of their rigs, for instance, uh, and what they do to mitigate. So uh, BP, for instance, is part of the CCUS project off the Humber, so that they will be mitigating through the carbon capture processes that they are investing hugely in to make sure they can do that. Because until we have uh, enough of the uh, clean energy solutions that can compensate for that, uh, no government can allow economies to crash completely. Uh, China is seeing real challenges at the moment uh, for lots of reasons, and the impacts of their energy shortages uh, are proving you know, absolutely catastrophic for many areas, many businesses, factories closed to three-day weeks, all those sorts of things. So we have to make sure that we move at the absolutely at the greatest pace we can, and the, world, in the UK is world-leading in that. Uh, and making sure that we sustain that. So with the oil and gas uh, issue, exactly to your point, um, and I've set running when I was energy minister, uh, something called a, get it right, a climate compatibility calculator. I think that's right, yes. So which is going to come into place so that the oil and gas association who do, the authority who do the licensing uh, of oil and gas will have a new framework to work within. So if a company can't justify the mitigating factors and the reductions uh, through what they do, they won't be uh, granted a new license. Okay, so both, both the, I mean, you, the International Energy Agency told the governments not to develop any more oil or gas reserves, so you've decided, as indeed China has and other countries, not, not to follow that advice. So these are not, these are not new reserves. The way, the way, it's important to understand this is the way things work. A reserve, I think, isn't it? So, um, so you know, it's part of, Cambo is part of an existing uh, field, and when when the initial uh, approvals are given, they know that over a series of years there will be other points within that that will come. So the work that the Climate Change Committee has done, and in all the you know the, the anal analysis that they do for the UK, they have factored in for us for our data for the for the very very challenging peaks that we've set ourselves where we know that that oil and gas will still be in our system over the next uh, 10 15 years you know i brought in the carbon budget the sixth carbon budget uh in uh july of this year uh which is a challenge we've upped our game on ourselves to 78 percent uh reductions by 2035 but that is is supported by the climate change committee assessment of the uh, the various sorts of energy that we will still need to be using to do that, mitigated, as I say, by things like CCUS. It's still the equivalent of a huge amount of emissions of numerous coal-fired power stations, however. Um, homes and buildings. In the UK, around 85% of homes are currently heated with natural gas. Um, 
Now, I know you're, you're keen about the, the heat pumps and you want to kick off um, the development of, uh, of private investment to support uh, the installation of far more heat pumps because you're quoting 90,000 homes at the moment, whereas the climate committee is saying we need 450,000 heat pumps. No, but people might think, why should I go for a heat pump, which may still cost me £5,000, even with the grant? Also a lot of inconvenience. Gas prices have shot up, but electricity is still likely to be far more expensive, partly because it's priced so high in the UK due to environmental levies. Will you be changing that? So yes, um, there were some announcements uh, this week uh, with the heating strategy that there will be a shift in those, as you say, those levies to uh, even out uh, how they sit between electricity and gas. But in the medium term, uh, there's a lot of work going on uh, within the uh, development of hydrogen uh, to think about how that might be used in our gas networks. I've just in, in, uh, put in in my house that I'm trying to make uh, net zero, uh, which is quite a challenge in an ancient Northumbrian house, um, a hydrogen ready boiler. So uh, the village is on gas at the moment, but uh, I'm uh, working on the basis that in due course uh, with the hydrogen coming through, I'll have the boiler that will adapt. But I think one of the really important challenges, and that's what the heat and building strategy is the first uh, iteration of uh, as government helps drive this forwards, is for me, one of the important things is uh, that we try and make our homes as fuel efficient as possible. So we reduce the amount of power that we use at all. And of yeah, course, new, can homes, I, can I new homes question? being built will have that opportunity, but for the very many 28 million homes uh, that are, you know, old homes, uh, we need to find uh, a number of ways to help over the next 15, 20 years, all of us find ways to make our homes more fuel efficient and therefore reduce both the bills and indeed the energy that we use. Yeah. Can I, can I see, you, and in your, your plan, from 2025, new homes will have heat pumps built in as standard. Um, and um, I hope you'll be bringing in higher insulation standards. I mean, some years ago, the Committee on Climate Change advised the government uh, uh, to improve the building regulations. And, and I heard the chair of the committee tell a parliamentary committee last year that since then, a million new houses have been built that will have to be retrofitted because you didn't bring in the regulations earlier on. Now, um, if you look around our countryside here, new housing estates after new housing estates are being built with homes that are just not low carbon and not ready for you know, properly insulation. Why hasn't the government like, tightened up building regulations years ago? So I'm afraid I can't speak for previous uh, members of government, but we are seeing a, a huge shift in that. And one of the challenges that Michael Gove has at, <coughs> excuse me, taken on in his role uh, as Minister for Housing uh, is to push that through so that we will have net zero uh, houses uh, being built, as you say, going forwards, which will have uh, both therefore more insulation and new clean energy uh, sources to do that. And I think that's really important. And we want to do that at pace. And the house builders, interestingly, of course, the house builders uh, are shifting and are much more willing to do that because we as consumers are much more demanding. Uh, and to answer your question, I don't know, but my uh, surmise might be that actually the consumer drive <coughs> and our commitment as consumers to wanting to be able to help in the, in the climate challenge uh, comes to these sorts of things. And therefore, house builders are therefore more inclined also uh, to think about how they can build houses differently. There's a big piece of work in across the construction industry and the organization construct, construct Zero, where they are challenging the whole construction se se sector to think about uh, and enact the changes that means that our, you know, our homes, our buildings will meet those challenges. Now, the Green Homes Grant was a 1.5 million <coughs> scheme for England, which launched in, launched in September 2020 and was designed to help homeowners afford energy efficient home improvements uh, and to help lower their emissions and energy bills, as we're talking about. This was scrapped after six months, having re reached a fraction of the 600,000 homes that Chancellor Rishi Sunak promised would be improved. And the scheme was reduced to 320 million to local authorities. Now, a, an influential committee of MPs said this flagship was botched, disastrous in an administration, devastating in some of its impacts, and stood in need, urgent need of rescue. What did you learn from that experience? So I wasn't involved in the scheme, it wasn't part of my portfolio, but I have uh, obviously been uh, able to see the, the, the Chancellor, when he set it out back in 2020, wanted to use it as a as a, an opportunity to stimulate 
uh, this market. Of course, part of it was, as you described, uh, for private homes, but a very large chunk of the whole program was for local authority funding. Uh, and now, and that is continuing, and so far, 3.4 billion pounds uh, has been put out to support those uh, in social housing, so councils can access this funding to uh, improve insulation, change heating systems, uh, and support those who are most vulnerable, uh, both in pure poverty terms, but also uh, in order to reduce bills, because as we know, a, a less efficiently uh, insulated home has a higher cost. So that continues to roll out. We've seen a lot of them in Northumberland, which is fantastic, but that fund is continuing to roll out for another two years. So the domestic side uh, came to an end uh, more quickly than uh, the Chancellor had set out originally, but a very large chunk of the whole fund is continuing to be spent to support those most vulnerable households. I think the scheme, uh, the Greenhouse Homes Grant scheme, was reduced to 320 million to local authorities. So that's loose. Then, if that's not the local authorities, because that was one way you could you could apply. You or I could apply uh, for a fund to do a particular project. There is a separately, as part of that whole package that the Chancellor set out, a big local authority scheme piece, which continues at pace. Let's move to transport, um, which I think is the highest sector for emissions. Um, I think, you know, the aim is that we need to drive or fly less thanks to better public transport, walking and cycling infrastructure and new incentives. Now, um, <coughs> you said that after 2030, we won't be able to buy a new petrol and diesel car. Uh, and you're now funding a further 620 million for, for zero emission vehicle grants and electric charging infrastructure. What about help to um, help to people to directly afford new electric cars? I was thinking, I mean, in, in Norway, for instance, in March 2020, sales of battery electric vehicles were more than 75 percent of new car sales. I think they're about 10 percent here. We seem to be a bit behind. So we're moving at pace. And interestingly, our car manufacturers have made some big decisions over the last 18 months, I suppose, to really uh, commit to shifting completely Nissan and Sunderland, for instance, uh, to building uh, electric cars so that by 2030, as you say, when you or I buy our next car, uh, should we want to do so, it will automatically be a uh, net zero emissions vehicle because that will be what's on the market. Uh, and I think one of the reasons of setting that, what was, I think, a 12-year window uh, to help drive that change is that, you know, you or I will, you know, and all uh, those who need a car to uh, get about will buy a, a new vehicle and therefore in the in the cycle of things when I come back to my point about this being a marathon not a sprint this is all part a lot of this is about our normal choices what government has tried to do is to provide the right uh, the right tools so that we can make those choices easily because the regulations will have helped uh, shift the dial in the way those products are made so we're seeing some uh, really exciting, real, really big commitments. We saw Ford make some new commitments this week. Stellantis have also made big commitments to move, uh, both not only in cars, but also to vans, so that those big fleets, because to your point about a big chunk of uh, the CO2 emissions we need to reduce being within transport, a lot of that is kind of fleet transport, you know, the, the delivery systems and all, all those areas. So they've also now made commitments in that area, which will help uh, move at pace. So as businesses change their fleets over every three or five years, they also will be able to buy uh, you know, clean energy vehicles to help uh, drive that down. So this is this is a continuous change, and as we as we all make our choices in our daily lives, it will be very easy for us to make the right choice. Okay. Now I know you just recently struck a trade deal with New Zealand. I mean, some people might think it. You know, given the costs of freight and the emissions involved in you know bringing stuff from across the world, wouldn't it you know be much easier to to trade with France? Well, we trade with France as well. We trade with everybody. Uh, the thing about trade is that it's about, you know, sharing uh, goods we produce with those who want to buy them and vice versa. I think one of your, your challenges that uh, the transportation issues are, are, you know, creating emissions, of course, they are at the moment. And that's why uh, we've been one of the first countries to do it. We brought in, at my point about the carbon budget six, that all international air and shipping emissions will be included uh, in our uh, numbers as we count uh, the state of our carbon dioxide, our CO2 emissions going forwards. And in doing that, that is driving incredible uh, research and development, uh, innovation, investment into clean energy for transportation. So it's not that you will never be able to get on a plane and go on holiday again, you'll be getting on a plane that will have clean jet fuel as its, as its source. So these are things, so in terms of shipping, a huge piece of work, lots of work in terms of hydrogen and ammonia, and thinking about those clean sources of power that can be used to power these transport methods that are critical to helping trade move around the world, because trade is one of the most powerful drivers of uh, reducing poverty and increasing people's quality of life, and we want to be able to maintain that.
I think the clean fuel in the aviation is just about 10%, I think. Now in Britain- At the moment, but that's why we're working so hard to build it so that it becomes the norm because clearly there is too much of it in there and we need to change that. Now in Britain, 15% of people take 70% of flights. Uh, the UK Citizens Assembly on Climate Change called on the government to make those who fly more pay more. Why not? So there are levies and I think to my point, we want to continue uh, to ensure that the aviation industry is moving at pace to have clean fuels as its as its method uh, of, of energy use, and that is working. That is now going at, at some pace. I was talking uh, to uh, a team from uh, the Royal Air Force just yesterday, who were working very closely with some of our big airlines to work out how we solve this really important challenge. Because stopping flying isn't the solution. Finding clean energy sources is the solution. But we, we, I mean, the, the Committee on Climate Change is recommending that um, flights do not increase. As I Sorry, that, that flights... That flights uh, do not increase, that we, that we need to keep, keep it pretty much steady as we are. Well, we do if we're going to have dirty fuels, but if we can challenge and find clean fuels that are not putting greenhouse gas emissions into the air, then we are moving to uh, a new era where we have clean transport systems, but also, you know, questioning, thinking about how efficiently we use our transport system. I think that's one of the challenges we set ourselves, as you say, domestically and day to day, that we think about being more sustainable uh, in, ev in every part of our in every part of our lives and that we make make those decisions knowing that uh, we all have a footprint and we need to think about it. Um, let's move to food and farming. Um, the, uh, the independent advisors say emissions need to be cut by 30% uh, from agriculture between uh, 2019 and 2035. What's the government's plan to help farming businesses locally here and uh, in Northumberland and beyond to, to, to adapt? I mean, we're having indications that ideally the population should eat 20% less meat and dairy on average by 2030, uh, more land shifting from agricultural use to trees and restored peatlands, and less food waste. So well, you've, you've covered some of the key areas, exactly that. So in Northumberland, we have obviously big areas of peatland and uh, the government published the uh, England peat strategy, Scotland published theirs last year uh, on how to maintain and restore peat because if a tree holds uh, you know, an amount of carbon, peat can hold up to 10 times as much carbon. So peat is an incredibly valuable resource as a, as a carbon capture and storage a tool, a natural one. Uh, and just and like you're going to be restoring 40% of peat by 2050, but the Climate Change Committee says 100% is needed by 2045. So yes, but as I keep saying, this is a marathon, not a sprint. We can only do so much and that focus on investing in that and making sure that we give the right uh, signals and the right drivers to encourage uh, those uh, who are responsible for the peat, peat bogs to maintain them and that's moving at pace now and of course uh, with tree planting and anyone who listens to Zach Goldsmith uh, discovers that he's even more passionate about trees than I am and the number of trees we want and need to plant is enormous and that's also part of that sustainability piece and thinking about the nature-based solutions but of course a lot of this across the whole uh, piece about food and agriculture is that subsidies are used across the world uh, in ways that don't necessarily drive the right decision. So as we've come away from uh, the EU and away from the common agriculture policy, we are designing at the moment, George Eustace, uh, the Secretary of State for DEFRA is designing a new system which will be uh, a way to support farmers whilst uh, challenging them to do uh, things that will Im improve their farms and make sure that they are going in the right direction, soil management, uh, changing their vehicles so that they also have uh, clean, clean fuel vehicles, all those impacts that they have, like any other business, in fact, but obviously uh, they are critical within, as you say, the uh, food and agricultural sector. So there's a huge amount of work going on now at PACE, and as, as DEFRA bring through uh, this new framework, that will be there both to encourage and support our farmers to make the right decisions. The challenges we have uh, to my, you know, to my role as the as the champion uh, for COP26 in this space is to challenge some countries where they are using subsidies which drive poor decisions and leave uh, worse outcomes from a from a climate change perspective and that's one of the big challenges we have both um, uh, through the UN system but also through the WTO where we have mechanisms to try and drive uh, improved uh, use of subsidy for good outcomes rather than poor ones. Uh, that's the World, World Trade Organization. Sorry yes. Um, uh, underneath all this is a huge importance of working with regional and community leaders um, and, and the government obviously needs to work out and promote uh, 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 a joined up integrated strategy which links them all together so everybody is facing the same direction on this. 
Um, one of the local issues that people, you know, get concerned about is recycling. Mm -hmm. Something like only about half of what's in our household waste actually gets recycled in any way. Um, and the household waste is only 12% of our overall waste. Now, the, the North of Tyne Citizens Assembly on waste and recycling said, recycling is still confusing. Local authorities are inconsistent in the materials they recycle, and there's no feedback to the public as to what happens with waste. So it must be made easier for individuals to recycle by providing clear and consistent information, including published figures of what is saved from landfill. Now, there are high recycling rates in Belgium and Germany based on rewarding good behavior. I save as you recycle, pay as you throw. Shouldn't there be you know, more government incentives for repair and reuse and a much greater clarity about what is happening to our waste? So we are covering many of those. We uh, just brought in some new legislation um, just a few months ago on repair and reuse. We have now changed the law so that, that will be a requirement that uh, manufacturers uh, provide uh, the various component parts. I don't know about you, but I, you know, uh, when I was younger, this was normal. You know, you changed the fuse in the plug. Uh, you know, if something broke, you got a new part to the uh, item. You didn't throw it away and, you know, just pop down and buy a new one. So we've now changed the law so that it will be a requirement for manufacturers uh, to provide the parts that will enable us to do that again. And I think there's a, a probably a big piece of education work because I think those of, you know, my children's age and stuff have not had that cultural uh, norm around them, but there's some exciting uh, developments to do there in terms of, you know, sustainability and using less resources, not only in power terms, but just in uh, wastage terms, as you say. Uh, I think uh, Northumberland don't do too badly uh, in uh, uh, waste management and uh, keep trying to encourage us all to uh, make sure we do reduce our waste. I'm a great fan of the compost heap. Uh, I don't know, you know, have pretty much no food waste goes anywhere beyond my compost heap uh, because I don't ever want to use peat to uh, grow my seedlings in the spring. So uh, I have uh, I have uh, my, uh, you know, remaining carrot peels and lettuce leaves become my compost for my tomato seeds the following year. Uh, but there's a there's a huge amount to be done, I think, on glass recycling uh, and those uh, areas where we know that there's high energy use into the materials that we're then throwing where we want to make sure that we recycle them. Um, and uh, DEFRA has got a huge piece of work as part of the Environment Bill to push forward on uh, what we're calling in the improvement of the circular economy. Uh, and there's a great deal in the Environment Bill which will help really push us all along uh, and help therefore the businesses we rely on uh, to do our waste management to do a both better job and help us to do a better job too. Now we talked about mitigation, in other words, you know, uh, trying to stop our addiction to fossil fuels, but you mentioned at the very beginning the whole huge importance of adaptation mm. and, and, and resilience. Um, now, I mean, I think you've been honest that about 10 years ago you had rather different views about all this. Uh, I mean, you know, there was that story about the tweet against uh, uh, wind farms, you said that global warming didn't happen and that um, uh, you know, you're sceptical, but what, what changed your mind? Was it the Morpeth floods in, in, in 2008 and 2012? Uh, certainly the Morpeth floods in 2008 were, you know, well, I mean, they were very, very shocking. And I was down there helping people, uh, you know, deal, deal with some of the challenges. Um, I think, honestly, I wasn't paying much attention. I think, like many, it was a faraway thing. Scientists talking in complicated terms. I was busy, you know, running a business, two small children, uh, you know, not terribly paying attention uh, to those uh, wider challenges, but yes, those, and I think, you know, the realities of, of seeing for ourselves, and, you know, I talked to many people who would have said they just, you know, hadn't got their heads around it, didn't seem relevant, seeing this, you know, this constant and uh, rapidly increasing levels of really shocking uh, climate impacts on many, many parts of the world. I mean, this year it's been extraordinary in places that you would never, never expect to see it. So I think there has been that change and many, many people just like me have gone from uh, just not terribly thinking about it to really starting to pay attention and considering things. You know, I'm someone who's uh, never put pesticides on her veg plot, always had a compost heap. Uh, in many ways, very sustainable. I have a drawer full of bits of string just in case they're useful. So there are parts of my daily life which are extremely green. Uh, in the macro piece, I'd never... You know, I, it wasn't something that had, had crossed my path particularly. And I think that's really no, important. No. And even now, I think we have a great deal of work to do. Uh, you know, this government is genuinely forging forwards uh, as one in a way that, I mean, you talk to anyone in government says they've never seen this 
coherence and this sense of purpose and determination that every part of government needs to be thinking about how they can help meet this net zero challenge that we've set. Uh, but we have to filter that out to everybody because it doesn't, you know, government can do a certain amount, it can change regulations, but it's you and me as citizens making our decisions day to day, it's businesses, small and large, changing those day to day uh, ways of doing business that will make the difference. Uh, and I think that is much clearer and it's much more urgent uh, than it was. And I think those, you know, like me who 10 and 15 years ago uh, simply weren't tuned in uh, to that now are and I think that's the challenge we have many more still to persuade but that's why the regulatory changes can help people make easy choices uh, where possible and that's really important. Yeah I think it was only sort of five or six years ago you were voting against a, a number of um, environmental issues in the House of Commons so uh, it's very interesting how, how, how radically you've changed. Um, the Environment Agency has just warned in a hard-hitting report that hundreds of people could die in floods in the UK and that the country is not ready for the impact of climate change. Now this is something that individuals can't do. Um, and in, in June, the government's official climate advisors warned that the, the government is failing to protect people from the fast rising risks of the climate crisis from deadly heat waves to power blackouts. What, um, what are you doing to address this? I mean, it's a very serious um, um, point from the Environment Agency and your climate advisors. So the Environment Agency have been driving a huge amount of work, both uh, reviewing over the last few years and indeed assessing where these climate risks are. Uh, and I work very closely with Emma Howard Boyd, uh, who is the uh, chair of the Environment Agency, as uh, she and her teams have really thought about. It's a really interesting piece in London, for instance, is the work that they're doing uh, on the Thames barrier. Uh, I went to visit just a few months ago and extraordinary talking to the piece about adaptation and resilience. You know, you don't think of sort of London having to do that. So we built a Thames Barrier. I remember it being built. I think I was 10 when it was built, the first one, with the idea that maybe, you know, once a year it would have to be, you know, the gates closed because there would be uh, a big a big storm surge either from the sea or indeed from rains coming down the Thames. It's used on a daily and weekly basis now. I mean, the, the you know, the whole uh, patterns of weather are completely different and it is not enough. Uh, so they either they were going to have to build 100 foot walls all the way up the Thames or they have to make another barrier so another Thames barrier further out near the sea is being built that sort of enormous adaptation choice which is a a one that is making London resilient because uh, the cost of flooding of London is would be so uh, exponential that uh, it's uh, it needs to be made at pace and they are of course looking across the whole country uh, and that's their uh, that's their challenge to assess where else the impacts of these changing weather patterns are likely to come and they're working very closely with um, they are an independent organization in that sense but with DEFRA to to build that plan to make sure but one of the interesting things is they're looking uh, holistically in a way that is relatively new for us uh, at river basins so the issue of planting trees and thinking about how upstream management can have a huge impact on those downstream uh, communities is something that is uh, I think very sophisticated and actually I've talked about as I've been traveling uh, with my COP26 hat on uh, to countries around the world about how they can think holistically about their uh, adaptation to protect and, uh, and enable communities to stay safely where they are. Okay, can, can we just move on, on to COP26 uh, mm -hmm. now and the work that you did there? Um, some developing countries are arguing that they have a right to do what Western countries have done for over a century. In other words, releasing carbon dioxide in the process of developing their economy and reducing poverty. I mean, how, how I mean, that's a very difficult question to answer, isn't it? And, uh, you know, shouldn't we be slashing our our emissions even further, given the long history, as you said earlier, that you know it's the richer countries that have been responsible so much for the for the devastation that poorer countries are already suffering now. So I think one of the challenges, and you know, I, I hear those messages regularly, is what they need is energy in order to grow their economies. Uh, that's that's what they need. They want to be able to grow their economies, as we did. We grew our economies. Uh, in the UK and you know through Western Europe two and three hundred years ago on the back of carbon, uh, but carbon as energy. So uh, what the challenges we have and what we are trying to do and the challenge of the hundred billion a year is to help those countries to build clean energy. Uh, so wind and solar uh, is now as cheap, if not cheaper, 
uh, than running coal and gas. So rather than investing in those technologies, we want to ensure that they can uh, build and invest in uh, renewable energy so that they can build their economies, exactly to your point, uh, absolutely, they shouldn't be uh, stopped from doing that, but they can do that on the back of clean energy. So that's one of the challenges. And I think our responsibilities uh, for those of us as uh, developed countries who have had uh, many years of uh, economic growth on the back of fossil fuels is to be making sure that the innovations and the new technologies that's coming forwards are available at a good price because we've we've spent uh, the investment developing them and commercializing these new technologies so that those developing countries can have the benefits and can build their, their economies with clean energy but what we uh, i think all agree is that you know we have to give them their tools and the challenges to help them to make those choices to give them the frameworks to help them build the sort of grid that can cope with that so that they can build their economic growth on clean energy. Yeah, I did hear someone who was very skeptical saying it was a bit like um, rich people selling people, uh, sorry, giving people spike drinks and then selling them the antidote. That's very, perhaps rather unfair, you'd, you'd feel, I'm sure. That's a slightly odd one. I've spent the last year trying to, uh, in, you know, uh, encourage and provide the guidance and the you know the technical support that we bring from organizations like the foreign commonwealth development office to make sure that uh, these countries can have all the benefits of the new technologies and therefore grow their economies uh, without uh, you know increasing the pollution whilst also uh, and um, the cop president alok sharma has spent uh, more i focused on developing countries and supporting their uh, requirements he's been focusing on really driving those mitigation challenges the un the un uh, climate change uh, system is all about uh, putting forwards each country putting forwards their journey how they see uh, they can uh, make those mitigation choices through their nationally determined contributions and we've seen a huge increase uh, in commitment It's not enough yet but a huge increase from where we were even a year ago uh, which is a good start but there is much more to do. Now you mentioned at the beginning the, um, the, the target to provide 100 billion a year in mm. climate finance to poorer countries uh, in the global south by it was by 2020. Um, I, I, I know you're very keen that that uh, target is met at COP26 mm. but um, I mean you know this year the government slashed overseas aid by nearly a third a cut of some four billion pounds and and it's been reported that governments around the world are still about 10 billion short is that correct? So I'm not very close to the detail. Alok Sharma is leading uh, this part of our work for COP26, but uh, the UK's commitment into, if you like, this 100 billion pot is, um, is a ring fence commitment uh, of over 11 billion over five years. And that we have, we doubled that last year. The Prime Minister doubled that commitment and ring fenced it to make sure that it was absolutely certain as our commitment to the 100 billion. The US have just doubled and then doubled again uh, their commitment, which is great news. Uh, and I think uh, I haven't spoken to uh, Alok Sharma this, this week on the subject, but I think he feels that we uh, should be able to get there. And the idea is that this is then going to be a continuing, uh, you know, in, in a number of ways, funds that can be uh, invested and support those countries that both want to, as you say, mitigate uh, by having clean energy solutions, but also to help with those adaptation and resilience investments so that those impacts, even if we fix the CO2 emissions today, we've got 100 years of overheated planet for which we will have to continue uh, to think about the adaptation. Some of the really interesting um, visits I've made uh, to, to farming communities where there have been disrupted uh, weather patterns. Adaptation can be relatively simple and indeed relatively cheap. So uh, in Costa Rica, I visited a farm where they created using a clay basin, effectively uh, a small lake from which they went from being a subsistence farm to being able to have cattle and pigs to provide high, higher value foods like cheese and butter uh, and all year round because they were able to have a reliable source of water. So it was, it was a £5,000 project, very, very you know, good value for money and it has completely altered how both that family and uh, three other members of the family have been able to come and grow. So adaptation isn't necessarily in itself expensive, but it can genuinely revolutionize the ability for those communities to stay in, in their area and work uh, and continue to grow their economies. So, so why slash overseas aid by nearly a third, some four billion? So as I've said, our climate finance has uh, been ring fenced and indeed has been doubled by the Prime Minister last year. So our commitment in climate finance continues to be uh, absolute and rigorous because the Prime Minister is 100% committed to this. It's genuinely his number one priority. Yeah, I think in that case, perhaps some of that money was just moved to a different pot, perhaps. Um, Minister, um, this is my last question, really. Uh, one of, and it's a huge, probably the most 
maybe the most important. One of the consequences of a hotter world is a mass movement of people. Um, so how, when people, um, you know, there's drought uh, or there's flooding or people just can't live any longer where, they, where they're living at the moment, they just have to move. How does the government plan to help communities adapt and offer compassion and resilience um, when faced with growing numbers of people fleeing from the consequences of climate change? So the challenges of climate migration are very real and uh, should you know, concern us all because uh, if the challenge in having a just transition is that we ensure that those uh, least able to uh, make uh, the difference themselves are protected, that is one of our key focuses. And indeed, that's, uh, as an example I just gave you, the sort of adaptation challenges that we're trying to help. One of the big challenges we have, and I've driven very hard for this, there will be a, a huge piece of um, uh, discussion uh, on gender and the impacts of the most vulnerable, many of whom are women and girls, to those climate challenges is something that we have brought right to the center of COP26, an area that uh, as Mary Robinson said to me when I first discussed this with her at the beginning of the year, it was always a bit of a side subject. You could find it in a little room somewhere. Well, we've brought it right to the center of COP26 so that it will be an integral part of the conversation, which is those most vulnerable must not be the ones uh, who suffer. So to do that, we need to make sure that we are uh, working uh, with governments, with you know, municipal communities, so that they can be thinking about the adaptation that's required, changes in uh, management of water, uh, in the power sources that they can access, indeed in the soil management, uh, so that those farming communities and those uh, in those rural areas can stay where they have been for years and can continue and indeed improve their farming outcomes. And in some of the big cities that have grown up, as we see particularly in Africa, those huge population growths in cities, we make sure that those cities are built in a resilient way. Uh, and a lot of the work that is coming from you know, great British architects and some of our fantastic technical experts is spreading out across the world to help make sure that those places are resilient and secure so that those young people, some of the huge numbers of under 25s across Africa, have a fantastic opportunity to stay in their countries, in their towns, and be able to be part of the economic future and not be battered by uh, the weather challenges that are coming to them. So there is a lot to do, uh, and the UK is leaning in with all our all our skills that we have, and indeed our uh, our you know our moral leadership in pushing this agenda really hard and demonstrating by ourselves shifting at the pace that very few other countries are to renewable energy. As you say, uh, not many years ago, most of our power was from coal. Uh, now we have. Uh, nearly 40% most days coming from renewables and we're moving at pace uh, to shift that even higher. So it continues to be a challenge, but one that uh, you know we are taking on full frontal, but it, it can't be done by government alone. Every single one of us has to think about which part of this big puzzle uh, we are able to help with. And in working together, uh, I, I genuinely believe we can achieve it. I'm, I'm a great believer in the ability of human ingenuity to tackle really hard problems. This is a really hard problem, but I think we can do it together. Minister, thank you very much indeed. And here's to a better, fairer, juster future for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good. Alistair will just come in. Oh, yes, there we go. Yay. Oh, 